10 second security tip, go. You can take calculated risks, but you have to calculate them. You need a thorough understanding of your threats, your vulnerabilities, and the consequential impacts to really understand and measure your risk. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Uh, My co-host is Mike Johnson. He's right here. Mike, you're here? I am right here. Right here, David. Yes. Right here in your head. Actually, I do hear you in my head right now. <laughs> and actually, we probably are uh, people listening to us. We're in their head as well. Absolutely. We are the voices in your head at this very moment. <laughs> we're available at CISOseries.com. We're on the subreddit, CISO Series. We also have a Friday video chat. If you have not joined, they are super duper fun. And we do these one-on-one meetups afterwards that are also a lot of fun. Our sponsor for today's episode is PlexTrack. Thank you very much, PlexTrack, for sponsoring this episode. You're going to hear more about them later in the show. But first, Mike, when this episode drops, it will be the week of the Black Hat Virtual Conference, the first that I know of of the big mega conferences having to go virtual. I honestly have no idea what to expect from this. (laughs) I, I haven't looked. You're actually going on vacation this week. I, I'm, I'm on vacation. I figured if I'm not going to Vegas, if I'm not going to be in the hot of Vegas weather, I might as well do something else. So I, I'm going to be okay. on vacation, maybe checking in every now and then. What, what I'm also curious about is uh, DEF CON is also all, all virtual. Mm-hmm. And I heard that it's free. I haven't validated that. Oh, really? Um, so that, you know, by the time that you're listening to this, DEF CON should be coming up, so take a look at it and maybe register. I'm really curious to see how these go. I I know Apple did their big Apple developer conference. Mixed results, mixed feelings from what I heard. I'm curious to see how it works for Black Hat and DEF CON. Well, they they have, I know on Black Hat, they have this platform. I forget what the name of it is, but it's designed for some type of meetup of people virtually. And then you can also like schedule people's time. Like people have, you know, they automatically give you a series of time blocks. I'm going to, I know I personally have a ton of work next week and I'm trying to like <laughs> figure out how I'm going to offload my work or push it to the side. So I, cause I do want to dedicate some time yeah. to Black Hat and some time to meeting people. I'll figure it out. I'll put some time aside because I'm I'm fascinated to see what they're going to end up doing with this. It's really interesting times. Uh, and, and for me, as soon as you were saying, hey, it's Black Hat time, immediately I went back to a year ago and how different Black Hat was a year ago. So I'm, I'm curious. And how much, I know it's also how much fun. We were there. Yeah, we had, had, a blast. had a great time. <laughs> had a great time. Well, I don't think I'll have nearly as much fun this year as sitting in front of my computer watching it, but I'll try to do my best. All right, let's bring in our guest for today. I'm very excited to have him. It is Matt Connor, who is the CISO for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Really excited. How CISOs are digesting the latest security news. If you thought tech firms were abysmal with the diversity hiring, it appears venture capital firms are even worse. In a Washington Post article by Natasha Tiku, just 1% of VC dollars went to black startup founders in 2018, and that same year end percentage reflects the number of black decision makers at VC firms as well. Now, with the scrutiny turned up, Small minority-focused funds have spurned, and there have been some cosmetic title inflation of minority employees at VC firms, but black tech entrepreneurs are brushing it off as diversity theater. So, Mike, I'll start with you. What opportunities and money do you believe VC firms are leaving on the table by not taking diversity seriously, and what should VC firms do to prove that their efforts are not diversity theater? First of all, kudos for the term diversity theater. Uh, I like it. I like that, it. That's, that's, a I, that's really why I said it twice. Solid term. <laughs> you know, security theater is something that we talk a lot about on this show. Diversity theater, that's a that's a great term. That said, I'm not a VC. I don't know how to get into their head, but I really think they're missing the same things that lack of diversity in general misses. Where you've got all of these people, same backgrounds, they think the same way, and you end up with groupthink. You end up with 
they're always thinking alike no new ideas come in or, hey, we've always done it this way becomes the default. And they miss these shifts. They miss these opportunities. You know, think about the rise of some of these online platforms like TikTok. Nobody saw that coming because it was everyone thinking the same way. It was Facebook and Twitter, and that's what we've always had. And that's what I think these VC firms are missing is these opportunities that somebody else comes up with, somebody else finds interesting, and they completely miss it because they're thinking all the same. They're all thinking alike. They could very easily miss the next great idea as a result. And I think in terms of fixing it, it's walk the walk. They're talking the talk. Great. Walk the walk. Let's open your books. Show us where you're investing your money. Show us that your funds are actually going to these minority-led companies that you're having an impact and not just diversity theater. Good points. All right, Matt, I'm going to take this to you. I know diversity is a major charge for you. What, what do you think VC firms are leaving on the table by not taking diversity seriously? I think Mike covered so many important points and a couple of words specifically resonated with me in my business. In the intelligence community, you know, uh, the word dangerous specifically rings out for me when I think about the key intelligence questions that we're trying to answer. And when you think about, um, you know, people around the table trying to apply their knowledge and their background to solve these problems or answer these key questions, groupthink is a dangerous echo chamber. And so I think about when, when VC firms, when they're underinvesting in diversity or when, and I do also love the, the idea of diversity theater. I mean, it's also virtual signaling, right? You think about virtue signaling these days and it's sort of endemic with companies out there right now trying to show that they're woke as it were. Uh, I think that, you know, the real, the answer to that is to listen, right? In, in the article you referenced, there are references, uh, and even in the summary, there are references to people feeling like it's just so much window dressing. And I think it begins by, by acting actively listening to people of color, of, of diverse backgrounds, and, and saying, what does real diversity look like? What does that look like in terms of investment, in terms of personnel investment, optimization? I think diversity is such a key mission-enabling virtue for any organization, whether it's making money or you know, protecting the estates. Well, one of the things I was thinking is, I mean, you just look at just traditional marketing in general and that different groups sometimes follow different trends and also want to sort of own something themselves, if you will. And if you essentially are ignoring an entire market, you're just simply leaving money on the table. Someone else is going to score it. And like you said, with TikTok, you know, the big, I do some work with VidCon, which is this big conference that, that is mostly, it speaks about online video. Mm -hmm. And the overwhelming audience here is teenagers. And the Big joke I make to my friends when I tell them about VidCon, I go, if you want to have, ever feel completely out of touch, go to VidCon. <laughs> because you will see this entire community that is following these video people, these professionals who online who have these enormous followings you've never heard of, but these teenagers going nuts for. And again, if you live as, you know, an adult white male in a VC firm, you're never going to know this or never see this. And that is opportunity missed. I think it's also true that people want to see themselves in the things they participate in, the things that they give their money to. They want to see themselves. Um, they want something to own. And I think that's, that's true in organizations or in markets. We don't have much time. What's your decision? Interesting question on Reddit by Throwaway Cost M, who asks... How do you create easy to memorize yet relatively strong passwords? Now, we all know a password manager is first and foremost recommended, but there are cases where you do have to remember a few passwords, like the one to get into your password manager and your desktop screen lock. And I would think probably your phone and well, who knows, there's probably a few others. There's some good answers in the post here. This was on uh, Reddit, but I'd like to know from both of you, I'll start with you, Matt. If you have to memorize, let's say, five really good, complex passwords, what technique do you re recommend to create those passwords? 
So I'm a big fan of the algorithm where you choose a complicated phrase that resonates with you and then choose the initial letter varying case, uh, adding complexity measures to that phrase. Uh, it's easy for me to recall that phrase when I'm trying to regurgitate a, a complex password. And, and you know, in the, in the DOD and the IC space, we, of course, have many needs for, for complex passwords. And so I, I haven't found a better algorithm with for me than, than thinking of that key phrase and taking initialize, you know, initializing it from it. Do you have a certain number of complex passwords that you, you just have to know that you can't have like in a password manager? Like to initiate these things, I need to know this many? Well, certainly we have, I mean, we, we rely heavily on multi-factor authentication as you'd expect. And so largely I'm remembering passcodes, but for certain systems that either are not PK enabled or MFA enabled, I have to remember complex passwords. Uh, we're trying to move away from them per NIST recommendations and per the way humans remember passwords. I think we probably all remember XKCD and correct horse battery staple, right? So we're, we're trying to move to those kinds of um, smarter approaches to password management in general. All right, Mike, I throw this question to you. I got to memorize five complex passwords. Do you have any uh, greater advice beyond what Matt suggested? <laughs> well, so first of all, David, I want to give you props for reading a username out loud. Because I did it. I do it completely wrong. You got it completely right. But you look at something like that and you think, gosh, how would I even read that out loud? So, you know, pr props for translating something that probably makes sense written down, but not so much when you when you say it. So but first, of all, I want to give you credit for that. Oh, okay. um, but beyond that, I, I think it's interesting the world that we're moving into with biometric identification. If you think about, you know, my laptop that I'm using right now, I authenticated with Windows Hello. I didn't actually type in a password. My work laptop, I use Touch ID. All of my Apple devices are all Touch ID or Face ID. And we're moving more and more towards that world where to get into your password manager, you can use something that you actually don't have to remember, that it's more of a property of what you are rather than what you know. And I think I, you're avoiding the question, Mike. That's what <laughs> I think you're doing. <laughs> you still have to memorize some passwords. And it's your cases you have, but, but the question was asked, how do you do it? But go, these are all valid answers, but it, it's not answering. Well, our, so our, uh, Matt, Matt kind of took my correct battery horse staple example, which is, you know, <laughs> literally pick four random words. Like just random words. Or, or a phrase that makes sense to you that, you know, an inside joke for them. I prefer the, the random word example because if it's an inside joke that you actually frequently say, then that's something that someone might actually try when trying to guess your password. That's why I go like the random word route. And the first time I actually write it down um, and I keep it on a piece of paper that I keep with me at all times, only I can see it always in my sight. And eventually, I don't need it anymore. Once I've typed it enough, I don't need that anymore. Uh, Bruce Schneier had an example years ago of you already carry around something that you protect, that you keep very secret, and that's your wallet. So writing down a password and storing it in your wallet actually works out pretty well for most people. So I, I think there's a lot to be said for recognizing what the attacks are and the things that we're trying to deal with. And you're trying to deal with someone out there who has this amazing corpus of passwords that have been stolen from umpteen gazillion compromised websites. So as long as you've got something unique to you that you're carrying around, you're protected from basically all the threats out there. So that's how I do it. Random words, write them down for a period of time, and eventually I can feed that, you know, I can chew up that piece of paper and, and swallow it and no one will ever know. All right. So advice to everyone, steal Mike's wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Who's our sponsor this week? It's PlexTrack. And here's Steve Prentice with more. PlexTrack is a reporting and tracking platform for risk management and for collaboration between security teams that provides the CISO with a holistic view of their risk posture, while allowing the reports and vulnerability data to get to the teams in charge of fixing the problems. 
Dan Duclos is CEO and founder of PlexTrack. He says the key is to get all the vital metrics and data in one place. At the practitioner level, we really support workflows for multiple different teams, right? So what might be in use today may facilitate one group, maybe like the GRC group, better than, say, the red team or the security operations team or even the vulnerability assessment team. You know, we bring those teams together and truly provide a single platform for the collaboration, not only within their teams, but also external consulting firms that are doing their assessments or the teams that are responsible for fixing the the risks that have been identified. Not only does this help identify the problem, it also helps get the ball rolling towards swift resolution. We integrate with things like Jira and ServiceNow to create tickets out of the risks that get identified within PlexTrack. But you can also use PlexTrack itself as that ticketing system to see who's assigned to issues. And then you can really slice and dice that data. So it brings all of that information into one uh, central repository. And now the system really only has to go to one place to get real-time metrics that they could report up to the board or to the executive staff. For more information, visit plextrack.com. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C.com. It's time to play What's Worse? All right. I say this all the time. Everyone knows how to play this game. It's a risk management exercise. I'm going to give you two scenarios. Both stink. I make Mike answer first. Matt, I'm going to remind you that I tell all our guests, I love it when you disagree with Mike. (laughs) So do your best. If you want to disagree, you don't have to. This one comes from somebody who sent us in lots of great what's worse scenarios. And by the way, I should mention, we need more what's worse scenarios. So send them on in. And uh, Nick McNulty of Manulife, he says, which is worse, an overly technical manager that is so busy doing hands-on work as to neglect managing and developing the team, or a security leader that is totally non-technical and as a result is constantly misunderstanding problems and solutions in front of the team and not properly representing them to the rest of the company and leadership. And I, as I look over to Mike, he puts his hands, his head in his hands, <laughs> and he's like, oh, God. So which one is worse? This one is a hard one. I, I like the ones that really apply to just like general human being interaction and not like this technical decision making. The technical decision making, those are always the easy ones. The ones where it's talking about people and how they interact, these are the difficult ones. And, and this is a great example. This is a lot of the job of the CISO, isn't it? Yes. Um, (laughs) So this is a great example where you've got someone who is in the weeds on everything and they don't come up for air. They don't come up to look around. Um, They're involved in everything. And it's difficult for them to maybe interact with the rest of the organization or to give their people what they need to help them grow. On the other side, you've got, you got to explain it to the person 10 times before they get it. (laughs) <laughs> or maybe they're making dangerous decisions based on their perceptions and their beliefs that can have significant consequences. It's like having my mom as a CISO. <laughs> <laughs> you know, David, I imagine your mom would make a great CISO. And, and that, no, 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 that's, you're, who, you're, that's who I have in mind as, 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 a, as a great oh CISO, as David's that, mom. That is, <laughs> that is a comedy of errors right there. So go on. Um, so... You know, it, both of these um, are bad, and, and really, these both of these are really bad. Um, th- this is choosing between real two really bad options. Uh, and as well, usual, you got to pick which one's worse. Around. This is me dancing around, and the one that I feel is worse is the one that's more difficult to change because both of these are going to suck long term. So I'm going to try and fix either of them. And the one that I think is a little bit more difficult to correct is the people who are just heads down in the technical weeds all the time. That's going to be one that it's really hard to bring them back out of that. The person who is getting the wrong answers and it takes a lot of explaining, but is interacting with the organization, is managing their people well and giving their people opportunities, that's someone that you can teach over time. And in a lot of cases, they're actually get out of the way. Yeah, again, you haven't talked to my mom, have you? 
I, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking your mom would be this great CISO, David. Uh, um, to, oh. to the point where I think between your mom and the overly technical person, I would prefer your mom. I think the oh, overly geez. technical one. You is really the worst want of these this company to, to fold, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get in good with your mom, David. Obviously. All right, Matt. Do you agree or disagree with Mike? And would you hire my mom as a CISO? So the contrarian in me wants to disagree with uh, with Mike just for the purposes of the debate and the discussion. <laughs> but I'm going to have to agree, and I do That's think that right. means circle gets the square. Uh, I think that, <laughs> that, that I think it's a lot easier to to hopefully over time. And I'm uncharacteristically idealistic that we could teach that security leader what they needed to know to make effective decisions. But I am worried about the the deeply technical person who lacks the the, the social skills to effectively build teams, invest in people, create a shared vision of success, all the things that we have to do as security leaders. So I think I, I'd rather have the, uh, you know, the, the Michael Scott than the Dwight. It's time for Ask a CISO. On a previous episode, CISO Dennis Lieber, now with the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, but previously with the state government agency, said there's no perfect pitch a vendor could make to him that would facilitate a sale. Heck, he couldn't even write the perfect pitch to himself that would work. Matt, we know the government is a different beast when it comes to procurement. What are the stumbling blocks vendors need to concern themselves with when pitching a government agency? And if you were working for a vendor tomorrow, how would you approach approach your own agency? Oof. A different beast could be the understatement of the decade. Uh, you know, when, um, so I guess I would first counsel all vendors if you're not in for the long game, don't play this game. The government is a monolithic uh, bureaucracy. And, and I have joked only semi, uh, only semi jokingly that um, that I think the government takes $4 to make sure we don't misspend a dollar. And so <laughs> from that perspective, patience is the name of the game. We are, I, I joke with my teams that I could do nothing but vendor engagement and still do it badly. There are um, just an infinite number of pitches. Uh, the challenge that I have from the government perspective is it's a zero-sum game. The budget lead times, the programming, budgeting, and execution cycle for the DOD and the intelligence community for the government really means I'm forecasting needs years in advance and programming for those resources. Um, any government budget person knows you can't hide margin. Margin is, is swept, uh, is the technical term. And so it's really hard to maintain a reserve for emerging requirements or something new you can invest in. And so it's it's pretty much always additive. We need to be able to understand, from a government perspective, we need to be able to understand, what can I turn off if I buy your solution? Because the pitches are almost always you know, value added, and that's tremendous, but just doesn't reflect my reality. The other thing that, you know, from my perspective is, uh, the more vendors speak our language, the easier it is for us to to comprehend it. We're not out with the VCs, we're not at all the major conferences. We attend plenty, but you know, we we sort of work within frameworks like the cybersecurity framework from NIST, and we're big fans of the attack framework as well. Helping us understand where solutions are are positioned in those frameworks helps us understand what risks we're mitigating. That's huge, and so um, that, that's the way I think you know to our hearts is a, a patient relationship building approach that talks about what we can reduce or replace, and in a context we understand. Let me ask, what would be, if you, if all of a sudden tomorrow you were working for a, for a vendor and, you know, obviously if you're pitching your agency, you'd have some connections over there, but what sort of knowledge do you think that's inherent of your sort of understanding of how the government works? What would be your unfair advantage, you know, as, I don't know, working sales or marketing or as a sales engineer, if you were doing that role and you were pitching the government, what, what leg up do you think you would have? Just so I understand, like, sort of what is the sort of the internal understanding that you've got that those outside don't have? Well, you mentioned networks, and I think that's usually important. I mean, there's no there's no substitute for personal relationships. Right. And one of the things that we prize when we're considering even test driving solutions, right? So, so many vendors are offering just take it for a test drive without recognizing their opportunity costs for theirs for us, us as well. 
is is the blue to blue connection. It's what we call the blue to blue, which is reflects the color of my badge that I wear every day as a as a government member of the intelligence community. I have a blue badge, and when I talk to vendors, when they offer us blue to blue connections, which is something that I would do in that that role, it'd be here's other successful deployments in the government and in the intelligence community, in the DoD, or even in some of the Fed Civ markets. It tells me that those people know how to deal with the government. They they know how to go through the the whole programming cycle, the requirement cycle, the the justification of the actual acquisition. As I say that, I realize that that sort of sounds like it excludes people trying to break into this market, but that is very compelling to me is when I can talk about it. And and I know that you are a big fan of diversity, so. <laughs> Look at that. So, I mean, we, we, we do deal with vendors uh, who have never broken into the government market before, whether that's services or s- solutions, and tools, those kinds of things. But really, the uh, it is easier when someone has a foothold in the market and they can say, hey, you should talk to, you know, general such and such at, at this place. They love our solution. Right. That, that's a big that's a big bonus. So uh, being a connector is probably the, the best advice. Right. That's there. true. Yeah, I think that's fair. We've got listeners and they've got questions. Jesse Rosenbaum of Veronis brought a job posting to my attention that showed requests for extremely specific experiences with different applications. Jesse asks, does the listing, the name of products or protocols you're using, expose the company to additional security risks? Isn't this the reason so many customers of security vendors are not willing to give testimonials? But if they're putting these products and protocols in job descriptions, isn't this the same darn thing? Mike? I cannot stand security through obscurity, which is really what they're talking about here. You know, if stating that my company uses G Suite, OS X, GitHub, Okta, and Linux is going to make me an easier target, then I've got bigger problems than that. I, I, I don't see them as secret information. These are things that people are going to find out. I don't think that the lack of testimonials for security products has anything to do with security. It's really more, it's, it's brand protection. It is PR, it is the lawyers that want to make sure that the brand of a company is protected. And so they're very careful about how that can be used. But but let me argue with that, because I hear continuously that specifically in security, it's that much harder to get a customer to give a testimonial. So that would lend one to believe that nobody wants anyone to know that I'm using company XYZ's product. So this is a call out to all of those companies who are saying that I'm depending on the fact that I'm using security tool X as a secret is somehow making my security better. Stop. It's not. It's not improving your security. There are many reasons why you may not want a vendor to use your logo, but it's not helping improve your security. It's a good point that there are people out there who believe that this is the case, that hiding what they're doing is a reason why they shouldn't allow their test their name to be used in a testimonial, but it's not actually improving their security. It doesn't help them. All right, Matt, I throw this to you. Do you think that the listing of what you need in specific in terms of products and protocols is in any way weakening your security stature? Do you agree with Mike here? Or and is it the same as, you know, companies not giving testimonials? So I, I certainly agree with Mike here. I mean, I think about this a lot like a crypto system. You know, if the security mm-hmm. in your crypto algorithm is it relies on it not being disclosed, it's a pretty crap crypto system. And for our <laughs> perspective, right, you know, when we advertise positions on on our hiring websites or you know LinkedIn or those kinds of things, uh, you know, we're not we're not worried about the the opsec of the specific technologies we use. You know, our our agency is somewhat unique in that you know our, we are determined to succeed in the open. We're we're pretty forward facing and internet facing for most of our. IC and DOD colleagues. Regardless, uh, you know, security can't lie in keeping those kinds of things secret. If you think about it, that information wouldn't stay secret very long. People interview for jobs. We're going to ask them what they know. We're going to tell them what we need. I don't think that there's, there's a whole lot of value in that kind of obscurity. All right. Well, you heard it here. Obscurity is not doing anything for your security. <laughs> By the way, that, that is a nice little rhyme there. All right, that brings us to a close on today's show. I want to thank our guests, Matt 
O'Connor, who is with the CISO with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. What I specifically want to thank you for is their second to last segment about you sort of opening up about the, the difficulty of working with government agencies. You are well aware of that. You know that and while you are pro-diversity, that it doesn't sort of lend itself to diversity. So you're aware of that as well. And uh, my favorite line is, if you're not in it for the long game, do not play. Yeah, this is patience, 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 sadly, which I know is a lot of security sales, but even more so in government. Uh, I would let you have the very last word here. But first, let me thank our sponsor, PlexTrack. PlexTrack, thank you so much for sponsoring this episode. Uh, more from them coming up. So stay tuned. Mike, I let you go first. And then Matt, last words. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you on the show and get your perspective. We haven't had a whole lot of government sector CISOs. So you brought a different perspective to the show and I appreciated it. I'm sure our audience will appreciate it as well. What I really wanted to thank you specifically for was your discussions about diversity. And I liked what you had to say. You specifically talked about diversity as mission enabling. And that's really, in two words, really captures a lot of the advantages of diversity and the things that people are missing out on by not focusing on that. So, you know, generally, thank you for coming on the show, sharing your experience, but specifically, thank you for that thoughtful discussion around diversity. Matt, uh, any last words? And uh, I always ask all my guests, are you hiring? Are you hiring? We are hiring. Uh, you can find lots of opportunities on usajobs.gov or more specifically, intelligencecareers.gov, which is a website we uh, we jointly operate with another intelligence agency. We're always trying to attract talent. And so, um, but similar to our, our vendor conversation, you know, the government is not uh, the fastest hiring organization. <laughs> so, so definitely be patient with the hiring process but uh, I think it's rewarding. It's a mission you can get behind. Uh, it's something to believe in. And so if you're looking for a little bit more than just a paycheck, please check us out. Thank you both for having me. It's been a privilege. And you probably discerned from, from especially from the vendor conversation that I used a, a little bit of this as, as group therapy for sharing, <laughs> uh, externalizing the challenges we face uh, being the government. I have a very good friend of mine who was a previous guest on your show and, and he was rubbing my nose in the fact that he was able to you know, come up with an idea for a solution and acquire it and deploy it within about six weeks and I couldn't schedule a meeting in that time. So uh, <laughs> I am very, very jealous of him, but yet glad to to share whatever I know about the secrets of, of government so acquisition. I, I, so then, then let me just ask in this closing question of, it's frustrating because things move slowly, but you said, you know, you want something more than a paycheck. So what what is the value what is the, the the enjoyment you get working for the government, even though it's so slow and frustrating? But it's compensated by what? We're protecting national security. We're protecting people. We have a huge humanitarian assistance and disaster recovery mission. I mean, for every significant disaster around the world, my agency is providing geospatial products there to help first responders, allied countries, uh, Fed Civ, any type of state, local, tribal governments, uh, giving them the products they need to save people's lives, to prevent property damage, uh, to assure national security. The things that we do, without exaggeration, make sure people in camouflage make it home tonight. I couldn't think, and as corny as this is, I'm getting goosebumps when I tell it to you. I, I couldn't think of something more moving than that. That is pretty moving. Well, thank you very much, Matt, and thank you very much for joining us and, and, and giving an absurd amount of knowledge. And I'm trying to think, Mike, have we had a federal... We've had state and local government officials, but I don't think we've had a federal one. I don't, I don't think so. I, th I think I you're think our first, Matt. Thank you. I think you're our first. So thank you very much, Matt. My pleasure. And thank you as always to the audience. As I have mentioned before, we greatly appreciate your contributions. Please keep them coming. Your questions, comments, any awesome discussions you see online, send them my way. And specifically, I need some more what's worse scenarios. I've got a bunch more, but again, from the same people. I need some new blood, new fresh blood for for what's worse scenarios. And be creative with these because I know that um, Mike likes a challenge, right, Mike? Absolutely. Love a challenge. I'm here for it. Thank you again, as always, for contributing, participating, and listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. 
Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.